Now available in paperback and Kindle Unlimited, E-Steam The Sands of Time. It's action and adventure in ancient Egypt in this terrific teen time travel romance. Get your copy of E-Steam The Sands of Time at your favorite online bookseller today. Last Sunday, as the Oscars were going on, I took a moment to watch Solo, a Star Wars story, on Netflix. And it's just as bad as everyone has been saying, and it's just as bad as I predicted when I was watching the trailer. Now, this Solo, a Star Wars story, it feels nothing like the Star Wars I grew up with back in the late 70s and early to mid 80s. It has none of the heart, soul, and spirit of George Lucas's original trilogy, nor does it have any of the heart, soul, and spirit of the uninspired prequel trilogy films, Episodes 1 through 3. At least with Episodes 1 through 3, I can at least say there is a semblance of the heart of Star Wars in those films. But with Solo, a Star Wars story, I feel absolutely no connection to anything as related to the characters of Star Wars or anything related to the Star Wars universe. When I look at Solo, a Star Wars story, I see the heart and soul of Star Wars, which was created by George Lucas, taken completely out of the whole Star Wars franchise, and instead, in its place, has been replaced by this bland, generic, uninspired vision of Kathleen Kennedy. And that bland, uninspired, generic vision is why we wind up with a completely bland and uninspired, generic-looking sci-fi film that shouldn't have a Star Wars name on it. Instead, it should just, just be called Bland Generic Sci-Fi Movie Number One Million. Now, your solo a Star Wars story is supposed to tell the origin story of Han Solo. But I believe that this was a story that just didn't need to be told because what made the Star Wars lore so great was we had, could use our imaginations to imagine what these characters were like in the past and we could imagine the events that transpired before they all these characters came together on Tatooine where your Han Solo finally ran into Luke Skywalker. I would rather have my imagination and imagine what happened than have somebody come in and try to tell me what happened because just like Wolverine this story falls completely apart and it completely tarnishes the character because with Wolverine once they revealed what Logan's past was really was like instead of allowing it to just be an imagined mystery it lost all of its aura and it lost all of its cool points. Now as everybody knows in the original trilogy Han Solo was this charismatic very roguish young man and that was the charm of Han Solo but in Solo a Star Wars story we don't get to see any of that charisma or charm one partially due to Alden Ehrenreich's extremely boring and uninspired performance and two it's due to the very lackluster bland and generic script where they clearly show that no one really did any sort of research into Han Solo's character to actually figure out what this character was actually like. Now, we get to see young Han Solo on the streets, where he's actually just called Han at the time, and he's going around doing street hustles and all, all sorts of crimes, and that's where we start to see the head of Kathleen Kennedy come in with her gynocentrism and her feminism. Now, your Han Solo is part of a band of thieves, and he's got a girlfriend named Kira, and they're making plans to get away from this worm-like female who is having them go out here and commit these crimes on the streets of the planet that they're on. So he's making plans to escape. He's got this little canister of this fuel that is considered to be extremely valuable, and we have them making this plan to escape the gynocentric fiefdom of the worm-like female, where Han does that by throwing a grenade or something that shines sunlight on the, on the worm-like female, and she falls into the water, and then they make their escape, 
And they finally go to this um, station, like an airport, and he's trying to get passage, and he uses the fuel to try to get passage, and he bribes an another female authority figure, which, again, shows me the gynocentrism here, female who's working the gate, and then they try to get by, and then Kira gets arrested because in the time that they try to get through, what happens is they wind up getting caught, and Han winds up putting on a bunch of disguises, and then eventually decides to join the Empire, and that's how he gets the last name Han Solo, because the clerk gives him the last name, because that's how he gets the name, because he's just by himself, so they call him Han Solo. I felt that that was really weak and really lame, and it just didn't really, we really, again, this is what, it sours the story in the same way Wolverine Origin really soured Wolverine's story, because it's telling us details about a mysterious past we didn't really know about. I really just wanted Han Solo to just be the space pirate, the dashing rogue, and being the charming guy, and again, Alden Ehrenreich's performance, you don't get to see any of that dashing rogue or that charm. You just get to see, basically, a simp who just says he's going to come back for the girlfriend who got arrested and go on a quest to find her. That There's nothing roguish or scoundrelish or very space piratey about Han Solo's origin story. Instead, we get a bunch of gynocentric female authority figures, and then we get a Han Solo, who basically, his whole mission for the movie is trying to go back to a girlfriend he had to wind up leaving behind. And again, that just comes across as really simpish, because you would think in the three years that he was in the Empire, he would have been more thinking about himself and his survival than he would about this female who he left at that station. That, that would be more of his mission but we don't get to see that because this Han Solo is such a beta, it's just not that funny. Now, your Han Solo, they show him really being a complete beta male in this film because as he's fighting in these battles with the Empire, he's just a complete coward. He's just running around scared, and he has no sense of real, real courage whatsoever. And this is just, it just runs completely out of character for Han Solo as I see it. I mean, yes, he's a space pirate and everything, but the way they have set him up, they just make him look like a complete punk. I mean, he's not set up to have any sort of heart of any sort, and that that was the thing that really irritated me, because Han Solo, yes, he, has, he was a bit of a mercenary, but he always had heart, and that was one of the things that you could always respect about Han Solo in the original trilogy was... He was always had this semblance of integrity, but I didn't get to see that in this film because these guys, the people who were writing it, just did not understand what the, what integrity was. Integrity isn't what he would would do when talking about he's trying to come back to Kira, that which was simping. It was having the heart to see things all the way through and stand by people. And Johan Solo in this film, he, he's such a coward and. He goes that he goes instead of trying to help fight for the battle in the empire. What he does is he goes off to, to help these other people who are, are come in covertly and infiltrated the empire, um, putting on officers' uniforms. And that's where Woody Harrelson's character comes in, and he's looking to come in and be a part of their hustle and try to get out to get out of the battle. And again, that just that's just not Han Solo. He's just a coward in that film, and it just it just shows the beta male tendencies of this character. He's going to go and join these hus these these pirates and try to get in on their hustle. And he wants to do this because he feels that this is the only way he will get the opportunity to be the so-called pilot, which is the best in the galaxy. And that's where I started to have another big problem with Solo, a Star Wars story, because that's where I started to see a big problem with the film, again, in the first 25, 30 minutes, was the passive approach to storytelling. And that passive approach to storytelling is one where, instead of us seeing act characters being defined by their actions, they tell us what they're going to do. And that was one of the things that irritated me a lot about Solo, 
is you hear all these big plans from these characters where they tell us what they're going to do instead of going out and showing us what they're going to do. And one of the things that really annoyed me about Solo was we never got to see Han develop as this so-called great pilot. I mean, yes, he was in some real tight situations, but we never got to see how he could get out of them with critical thinking or problem solving. Instead, we saw a lot of cowardice. Now, everything builds into another sequence where they're getting ready to do this heist on an Imperial train, and that's where we see more identity politics um, permeate because we have the Fanny Newton character and the Woody Harrelson character, and they're pushing the swirling agenda of the black woman and the white man. And we see this young Han Solo again. He's He finally got Chewie out of the cage, and that was another origin sequence that annoyed me because, again, we have him being a complete beta, coming up with a plan to get out of something. And again, he winds up in the cage because he's just a complete wimp, and he wants to run away, so they just want to feed him to the beast just to get through with it. But he, he talks Chewie into getting them both out, and then they join up with Woody Harrelson's gang, and they only want him because she has Chewbacca as the muscles, which shows how little respect people have for Soilo, the beta male who wants to be like Han Solo, but is absolutely nothing like your Han Solo. But as after he gets the team together, that's when they do the big heist, and again, we see your Han Solo, Mr. Beta Male, make a complete mess because he runs into the Marauders and then he then punks out once again by dropping the fuel and allowing it to blow up and shatter half of a mountain and then take away their haul. Now that haul was desperately something they needed because Woody Harrelson's character owed Crimson Dawn a big amount of money. But that all leads into a later part of the story where your Han Solo finally runs into the leaders of Crimson and Dawn and he finally meets Kira once again. And that's where we start to see the simp tendencies come out of your Han Solo. And that's where we really start to see him starting to simp because he doesn't listen to the Woody Harrelson character who tells him don't talk to anyone because he understood that if you talk to people you don't know and circles you don't know, what's going to happen is they're going to set you up and play you. And because your Han Solo is playing Candyland, he can't see the chess pieces on the board. And that winds up leading to him becoming checkmated later on. Now, your Han Solo in the story, again, he runs into Kira and he starts simping, even though this guy, he's the, um, she's involved with another guy, um, the boss who is of, who runs Crimson Dawn, and he just doesn't really see the big picture regarding things. So he's thinking that he can get back with this Kira, and they come up with a plan to go get this, um, whatever that fuel is that was blue and glowing, and they decide to go someplace else to go get some of it on another planet, and that's where we have that weirdo Lando Calrissian brought into the film. And this is not the Lando who was the smooth operator, the cool guy from the original trilogy in Empire Strikes Back, played by Billy Dee Williams. This is where we get another beta male sexual deviant, like I talk about in my book, The Man Crisis. And your L337 is nothing more than a robotic version of a sapphire. And they both have this weird codependent relationship that is disturbingly bizarre. I mean, you have Lando Calrissian, who's supposed to be the smoothest guy in the galaxy, the most charming guy in the galaxy, and he is being henpecked and castrated by a feminist robot construct. And that was a way of emasculating your Han, not Han Solo, he's already being, he's already a complete simp in this movie. Um, your Lando Calrissian, he's, a, he's being emasculated in this film, and he's being emasculated by his own service droid. And that, that is just, again, completely out of character for your Lando Calrissian. Because anyone who has watched the original trilogy, we all knew that Lando Calrissian was a boss on Cloud City, 
and he was a very skilled and smooth operator. So it makes no sense that a guy like this is going to turn into a smooth operator. Just it's not something that comes organically as a, as a, a guy comes in the manhood. Because once a guy becomes a complete beta male like that and is completely submissive like that, there, it's next to impossible for him to gain that type of confidence within three to five years as they write in from Star Wars, from this point to Empire Strikes Back, because I believe it was like three, four, or five years before um, Empire Strikes Back, because this solo movie is supposed to be young Han Solo, which is about three, four, five years, because everybody in Star Wars is about, let me see, Lucas 16, so I would, I'm, not, I'm not three to five years, maybe seven to ten years, but even in seven to ten years, I just don't see your Lando Calrissian becoming this smooth operator, because he would have been smooth from day one, and he would have been really working, he would have worked on his game to the point where in order for him to be wealthy enough to get a Millennium Falcon and wealthy enough to be able to hustle people and have those, that mouthpiece, he wouldn't be allowing himself to be dominated and emasculated by this robot. But that L337, another Kathleen Kennedy edition, she's just there to spout Kathleen Kennedy's identity politics and she's just there to promote the whole feminist narrative and the gynocentric narrative we see throughout the movie as related to the female authority figures which have been placed throughout this movie from the worm that Han Solo was working for in on the, on his planet to the female who was running the station where at the gate to this um Kira who has become this prominent female figure and this L337, another female in authority. This female goes out of her way to emasculate your Han Solo as they go on the mission to that planet to go get the fuel. And we get this scheme that just, it just does not really come together in the film. So everything comes together as they get the fuel. And then later on, after they get the fuel and they have the big chase where the Millennium Falcon it breaks off the escape pod, and they finally use some of the fuel to go through the hyperspace. Uh, we finally get the, the them going to this place to refine the fuel, and then we get Han Solo becoming the worst simp of all because he runs into the Marauders again. The the one of the leaders of the Marauders takes off their mask, tells him a story, and he just goes with the story, and again showing how much of a complete simp. He actually is. He goes with their story, then goes back and tries to hustle the leader of Crimson Dawn, gets into a big fight with the leader of Crimson Dawn, and then eventually winds up getting cucked because your Kira winds up killing the leader of Crimson Dawn. Your Han Solo leaves with the fuel. And what happens to Kira? She gets to take over your Crimson Dawn, and your stupid simp Han Solo doesn't see how he even got played by this female. Because again, your Han Solo is too busy playing Pokemon Gold to go out here and understand what the game of chess was and how he got checkmated by this female who now has the leadership of the Crimson Dawn and practically just used him to get the Crimson Dawn. Now, I know I went over a lot of things like your L337 getting blown up, which was one of the most fun parts of the film because she was just an annoying person uh, in the film. She was just an annoying robot. But what really irritated me about this solo movie was, again, it tarnishes the legend of Han Solo that many people imagined in their minds. Because at, in the original trilogy, we got to know this really cool kind of older brother character to Luke Skywalker, this kind of charming guy who was this space pirate, this guy who had a gift of gab, and he also had some real skills and doing things, and then all of that was t tossed away so we could get this bumbling, stumbling beta male who winds up simping on every female who comes to him, and every female winds up using him from your Kira, who used him to do her dirty work so she could take over the Crimson Dawn, to the female who ran the rebellion who used him to get the fuel. 
So how is Han Solo made to look positive in this film about where he was in the original trilogy, this charismatic space pirate who knew how to do these runs and knew how to make money at doing these runs when in this film we see the foundations of this bumbling, stumbling idiot who couldn't even get paid at, out of this deal for himself. I mean, for all of this being a space pirate, he does a very terrible job of being a space pirate. He doesn't get that much money, because at least in the original trilogy, at least Han was able to get some money out of the deal, and he was at least able to get paid for helping save the princess. So he got something from the Rebellion for his troubles, but in this film, Mr. Space Pirate can't even figure out the game. I mean, a savvy space pirate, a guy who's been living on the streets, you would think he would have the skills to know how to deal with things, how to navigate things, but we don't get to see that because, again, your Kathleen Kennedy, she wants to go out of her way to give us strong women at the expense of the male characters and at the expense of the legend of Han Solo. So that was some of the things that really irritated me about your Soilo, a soy war story, as Ethan Van Skyver calls it, is that we have all of the, you have the great Han Solo completely emasculated in his origin story. So how can we see this bumbling, stumbling beta as a legendary hero when we see your Kathleen Kennedy taking all of the masculinity out of Han Solo, pushing a gynocentric narrative where Han Solo is minimized, emasculated, and marginalized by hero by women and shown no respect whatsoever. Yeah, we get some sequences where we get to see Han's iconic blaster, and that was given to him by Woody Harrelson, but we don't get to see what makes Han Solo the man that he was. And that was one of the great things about the original trilogy, was we got to see the patriarchal line from Luke learning from both Han and Obi-Wan, and it was those men who taught him how to become a man, but I don't see how Han Solo could have any way, shape, or form taught Luke anything if he was this bumbling, stumbling idiot himself. So again, this film takes away from Han Solo's legend, and it would have been better off if they had not made this movie, because we were left with a better story about Han Solo in our imagination and the expanded universe than anything we got in this disaster of a movie. Solo, a Star Wars story, the best place to watch this film is on Netflix, because if you paid money for this, you paid too much. And if you paid anything for this movie, you should go back to that theater and demand a refund. If you'd like to see me make more videos like this, you can donate to my Patreon by clicking the link in the description box. And if you want to try some of my SJS Direct publications like the ISIS series, the E-Steam series, the John Haynes series, the Temptation of John Haynes, and the Spinsterella trilogy, you may do so by clicking the link to Amazon.com in the description box. That's all I have to say for this video. You can comment, rate, and subscribe.